Hello, my name's Elise Kylo, and I am on staff here at North House Book School as part of the ADP Artist Development Program. And I am lucky to be focused on wool. My work for the last year and a half has been learning how to be a better felter and um, how to work with wool. And knowing different breeds of wool is a really big part of what I'm trying to be proficient at. Um, if you look around the space, you kind of get a sense that I'm sort of a painter. That's my background. I love color and I love uh, the playfulness of what you can do with wool. It's I like that it's super practical. You can make things for winter and we live in Minnesota so wool is like one of the best materials we could wear on our bodies. Um, I'm ready. I'm ready for winter. <laughs> but this is a, I've been a, it's a long time coming working on a vest and kind of perfecting. I still, it's not perfected yet. Look at the pockets. They're not quite right, but I'm going to keep on working on this one. Um, but I like making a lot of small things and cast iron pan cozies. I'm always looking for ways to use wool to replace other materials that we have on our life that are not as positive. Um, I mean, wool being 100% organic and renewable. Um, that's kind of why it's one of my favorite fibers, really. It's the color and that it's such a pure, pure process of just wool, just water, and soap, and human energy. My energy mostly, not machines, but hand energy. Um, and while we're together today for this Lunch and Learn, I will be talking a bit about um, the wool, type of wool that I like to use. I will do a little teeny demo of layout if we make it that far. Um, and you kind of look at a few things that I like to make and why I use certain types of wool for those things. So let's go over to the felt table. Well, Martha Anderson Williams has already said, you are so fun. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I feel that's, that's dead accurate. <laughs> so the beginning of a felting project for me is usually not the dirty wool. Okay. It smells like a farm and it's greasy, full, and, and I love wool but it's a, a long process to do it yourself. And so in general, I am buying wool. But I like, it's, I've done a bit of processing myself. It's just nice to know the time it takes and to be aware of your material, where it comes from. But so this is just a, the look of the wool right off the sheep. Greasy, and this is not the color of the sheep. This is the color of the sheep once it's washed. Just with hot water and soaking and rinsing again and again. Um, and I have a bunch of other little bags here because not only does wool felt, but cat hair, dog hair, camel hair, yak, llama, lots of things do felt, but not any of them are as good as wool because wool has these microscopic scales within each fiber. Then when you add warm water and those scales open up. So it's just this magical thing that happens when you're agitating and you add soap, they slip around and those individual fibers will bond together with your agitation. So this is the wet felting process that I love so much, um, that it makes things that are so durable. For example, this is a kind of wool that is used by fishermen in Norway, Scandinavia areas where it's super durable. I'd say it's itchy and I would never want to wear it. But if it was a frozen mitten, you would dip it in the ocean, you would break the ice off, get the water out, smack, 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 and put it back on, and they're actually gonna keep you warm. So then there's another type of wool that is uh, softer, and it's a Corydale or a Merino, and that's something that I would wear. Um, it's a difference, and this kind of example of wool is so many varieties and so many things it can become. Um, 300 types of sheep in the world, something like that. And every breed of sheep really has a different quality of some you might want to use for rugs, some you might want to use next to your body. Some are strong, some are, are going to fray and fall apart. So part of my two-year process has been really um, getting to know different breeds of wool and doing experiments. And so this is a little sample here of every single one here. They're called test samples. So as I've gotten to know wool, better. I'm starting to be a little bit more scientific and less just artistic. <laughs> and uh, 
So doing trials before I make something large like a vest, which you put a lot of time and material into, it's good to know the wool before you begin. So here are some test squares. So every one of these began with the same amount of wool, the same time frame of, of, of agitation. They've all been through the same wet felt trim process, but they each one shrinks differently. Like this one is super durable called C1 Pelsu, one of my favorite wools to, from Norway, one of my favorite wools to felt with. And this one is a combination of, I don't remember. I don't like it, so I don't remember. <laughs> but it's kind of weak, and, it, and it's never gonna be a good strong wool. Are um, you buying those pre-dyed, or are you dyeing them? These were dyed, these are all dyed, yep. Yep. And these are some natural other ones, the brown and the white and the gray are natural wools I got locally over the last many years and I've been experimenting with them trying to make use of local wool. So, but I'm not much of a dyer myself, so here they are, gray, black and brown and white. <laughs> so um, here are some samples of things. I'm also doing work on combining fibers and fabrics. So here's this also the same size as the rest of them, but adding cheesecloth, no, that's silk. This one's adding cheesecloth and just seeing how they combine and affect each other is a really fun process of felting. Adding yarns, adding silks for decoration. So you can see how the possibilities are endless and how you could make mistakes. Some things you add together, they don't work. Like this morning, I put together, this is Angora from a goat super soft and it has its purpose in the world um you think about those cashmere scarves that you can buy they're stunning they're soft um, but i i carded it on my carters and i mixed it with some other wool i had and i found out when i felted it did a little sample and the angor or the uh, the goat hair just comes right out so it just it's always going to be like a pig pen <laughs> item it's just kind of floating about so that's not a successful thing but as part of the experiment I actually um, put all of those fibers into the carding machine and I made a bat so now I know this bat may not be very useful unless I want something that will be hairy <laughs> Let's go. I think I, I might do a little bit of carding right now, just kind of as a first step, because the carding will lead to a little project at my other table, which is making a small bag. Um, what I have are different types of wool and different ways that are processed. Here's a bat. This is very basic stuff for felting. So some of you are, I know all this, but others might be interested in some basics. So you can buy wool as a bat form, and it comes in sheets that are four foot by six foot or, or smaller or larger, but the fibers have been kind of randomly uh, placed. So you have a bat with all the fibers sort of tangled already, and they can pull apart in thinner strips. So if you're a wet felter, bats are a really nice way to go because you lay things out in big sections. Um, another way to buy wool is in roving. And this is merino, which is super soft. And often when I make things that are close to the skin, I will use roving. But when you lay that out, it takes a little bit of a fussing because you lay it out thin and it's, see how it's linear? So you end up having to go back the other way. And that will cause for even shrinkage and crossing over will cause for less likely of wool to pull apart and a stronger bond. And so you would do many layers of that. Um, you can see how that compares to the batting. Both have their purposes. And then there's something called um, like a merino bat. Super fun to play with. Um, let me pull one out for you so you can see the, the beauty of it. This is like a commercial fur decadent fibers, I don't mean it to be, but they're a company that produces merino bats and they hand dye them. And so the wet felt with this is super fun because you're already thinking like a painter. 
with all the colors. Um, and maybe I'll show you something I've done with that so you can see. Oh, right here. So here's a bag um, made with that jelly roll, but the inside is a combination of a more durable wool, because merino is never very strong. Um, it's great for wearing clothing and you add it to silk to make, give it more strength. But with this case, I've added to a more durable wool, the black wool. You can see how it creeps through and bonds onto the, mer onto the merino. Nice combination, but it makes it for a stronger, more durable bag. So if it was just merino, it would be less, less likely to hold together over time. Then I was gonna, <laughs> I, I was going to uh, do a little carding, and I'm gonna combine, as part of a project, I'm gonna make a small bag when we're together, is to combine these bats I have, which is, I think, a Corydale, I'm not sure, and I'm gonna combine it with a Merino, and I'm gonna add this other fiber, which will give it some more strength. So what I'm going to start with is these locks, and I'm going to first tear these open, pry them open. So I want to put them on the hand carters, but I first have to tease them apart. Can you repeat the company that sells the merino bats again? Yeah, Decadent Fibers, and they're called Jelly Rolls. And you can request, I want a jelly roll that looks like cotton candy, or, <laughs> or lichen, or what, yeah, anything in the world and she'll dye, hand dye you a jelly roll. Okay, so I'm prying those apart so I can put them on the carter. And what I'm making will look something like this. So I'm mixing together different breeds of sheep. Because I, I'm doing this because I want this color to be combined. And uh, I want the strength of this fiber and the softest of this fiber and this there because I have it, a lot of it. So now I'm just going to gently card them together. And I'm no pro at carding, but it's not too hard if you haven't done it before. It's a bit of practice. So you just go on the U YouTube, of course, but pulling across and pulling the fibers apart. And I'm doing it just enough to mix these fibers up. And then I'll pull down and pull down from the top, and then I'll have a bit of wool here. I'm going to do that one more time. And you don't want to put too much wool on a carter, because it will just work against you. It'll just be, it'll ball up. So I want a little bit of each, and just pull, push it down and pull it across. And then start from the top and switch your hands over in the other direction, in the other direction. And if it's not done well enough, you can pull down from the top again and recard it for a better mix. So a couple people that are really pleased with your vest, Lily, so. Oh hey! That's a work in progress, <laughs> but people people are loving it. I like it too. Thanks. Okay. So in general, I am not doing the processing myself of my wool because as you can imagine, this would take a lot of work. There's a lot of wool in this vest. And so I buy most of my wool already colored and processed. Um, but I want to do a little bit just to show you kind of the process. And if I want to make a bat out of this, which looks I would come back and I would get something like this, which is great for felting. I would put all this through here and crank it. I don't think I'm going to do that right now. It's not hard to do, but it's they're not cheap machines, so most of you won't have those. Um, and I don't need to make a bat. I'm just going to use this as it is. So we're going to go over. I'm actually going to do a little demo of a, a bag. Karen was asking about the weather today, if your vest was needed. Needed. There's not a day in Grand Marais that you don't need wool. <laughs> Every single day of the year. <laughs> That's my feeling. So the tools of felting are so simple. Um, 
Like I say, it's just that's one of the beauties of the of the craft. It's the wool source, and you can look at my my product. Some bubble wrap, it's a, a old curtain from the store, some under uh, rug layment, and there's not a whole lot more than that soap. So what I'm gonna do is be making a bag. Can you tell how much time we have? I can tell, and I can kind of guess what. 12.15. Okay, that's good. So in reality, a bag like this will take probably about an hour, but I'm gonna do a layout with you. So you can kind of get a sense of why I love wet felting so much. Um, it's that process of this wool becoming this in a pretty short amount of time. Something that's so durable. Um, so I'm going to do the layout of the wool so you can kind of see what it takes. And then you can kind of see how the, the wet felting happens. Um, I may not finish it, but I'll, I'll tell you what to do it or how it happens in the end. So here's the wool I, I put together through the carter, and what I'm going to do is lay it out over this resist. So this resist is the inside of, of the bag. So I'm creating a, po a pocket of wool. I'm going to try to keep things from blowing away. Maybe I'll get this wet. Oh. In here I have warm water. And I have a little bit of soap. To me, it's not a science how much people ask, but well, it feels slippery. And if it's mountains of soap, it's too much. I've gotten that wet just so that I, this, the wool doesn't blow away when I put it down. So actually what I'm gonna do, I have this wool, which you can see it's kind of random the way it's been carded. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to add, ooh, red would be nice, a little bit of the other jelly roll as a really good solid base. And you can see how this is consistent, unlike my random carding. So I'll begin with one layer of red. And I'm going to go up to the edges of the resist all the way around. If I see thin spots, I'll add a little bit of wool. And I'm pulling off extra on the edges. And I'm gonna, so what I'm gonna be doing is adding hopefully an even amount of wool, thin. If it's too thick, it becomes too bulky of a, of a piece. I want it to be consistent and thin. I want it to go up to the edges, but not too far over. Okay, feels pretty good. And then I'm going to cover it up and get it wet. just enough water to saturate the wool. And I'm going to flip it over. And now you can see the resist in the middle. And I'm going to pull the edges right up to the resist. Wool is quite forgiving. It looks like it's a little bumbly mess, but I'm going to try to wiggle it in so it's a little bit smoother. Corners are always hard, but again, as I say, it's forgiving. It will felt together. fibers to stay put just by pushing down. I can add a little bit of soap, which is like a glue. 
and I'm really gently rubbing. Okay, there's one side, and now I want the second side. It's kind of, it's nice, it's a nice layout right here. I don't need to fuss with it too much. A little bit extra there. You want to go up to the edge, maybe a little bit over. If you're beginning to wet felt, this is kind of a, a good place to begin, it's just with a small bag. Make some mistakes with small items first. I've learned that the hard way. I have one wool jacket that took about 24 hours to make, one of my first uh, garments. And I added, I forget what kind of fiber it was, but it was some kind of fiber that just flew off. So it's like being pink pen. <laughs> I can't wear it. <laughs> but it was a lot of wool and a lot of, a lot of work. And it was a failure. So that's sort of going back to these test squares of knowing your wool, trying these wool out, these wools out before you commit to a big project. I'm going to flip it over again, turn the edges over, turn it once again, turn the edges over, and you want to get as close to the resist as possible, otherwise you're going to have this little seam along the edge, so you really want to hug the edge of that resist, that piece of plastic. And then my next step is going to be putting on the wool that I carded, the combinations of fibers. And I actually don't know what they will become because I've never combined these fibers together, but so what I want to do, they're all kind of random, so my goal here is to put fiber down and stretch it so it feels consistent. So it's a nice even layer. I think randomness is okay of how the fibers lay out, but just so it's no, there's no gaps. And the edges, if, I, if there's time to take off on the edges, I'll just put my hand down and pull off the extra. I do hope you can see this kind of finished. I'm going to work fast, but <laughs> it would be a pretty major feat to finish this in 15 minutes. It's kind of impossible. All right. And I feel for where it looks thin. I'm going to add some fiber where it looks thin. And there's a, there's a trick to felting of when to know uh, how thick it should be. Because you can make things that are just too rigid. Um, and ideally it's thin enough to be flexible and um, not like a, like a loaf of bread. All right, water. Sometimes I use olive oil soap instead of Dawn. It just kind of depends what's around. And I always have all of olive oil bar in my hand when I'm felting because it acts, acts as a lubrication so you can slide over the surface of the wool really easily. And, that, and it also opens up, changes the pH of the wool, which fascinating thing about wool is the chemistry of how it works. Um, and many day, many years ago, they were not using wool to change the pH, but they might have been using wood ash or urine. Um, and I'm sure they didn't wash their wool first for many projects. Projects, it was just wool right from the field. The 
and be felted with water and agitation. All right, I'm gonna turn that over like we did last time. You've inspired Vienna Volante to do some um, multi-color ro multi roving outdoors. Uh, yeah, it's Don't great to be outdoors. working outdoors, yes. I would say, yeah. Love that there's no worry about water on the floor, being in the sun. Okay, and when I want things to stick down, I often will add soap to my hands and work those fibers in gently. With enough soap, you don't, this, the wool won't stick to you. There's that nasty corner that likes to bunch up. So you kind of pull it in, try to stretch the wool so it's more even. That's a sign of a really good felter if you can handle those corners and they don't get chunky. And that's just practice. Okay, so I think that'll stay put. And next layer goes on. So I could just do that. <laughs> Flop it on like that and it would work. With third graders, we do that. <laughs> and it's amazing what they become. They're beautiful. But I also am aware that even is better. Oh, I can't say it's better, but it's, yeah. It's the challenge. It's the challenge of making a very even, consistent layer. And that actually is no, it takes a bit of practice to get this down. You can also be aware of fibers in which direction they're going. It's hard to see that, but sometimes there is a, a way the fibers travel and you want to be cross-hatching them, going back and forth. Okay. And I'm often thinking like an artist, so it's I'm not so concerned about perfection, but more of I guess feeling and color. Again, it's compressing, getting just enough water in there to saturate the fibers. And I can soak up some of the extra water because you don't want it to be flowing down the table. I'm going to flip it over one last time because you can see I have edges to deal with. So. Okay, now turn the edges over. So at least that is a, a, a rug pad basically, like a thing to get, keep your rugs clean. It is, it. yep. Mm -hmm. People can use, you can use bubble wrap instead of this. You could use a um, piece of plastic, just thin plastic. Um, curtain works, like a sheer curtain, nylon or polyester. I've tried to uh, use sheets because I'm just trying to get away from all this plastic stuff. Even nylon and polyester is not a great product in the world, but sheets don't work. Cotton sheets are nice, but so I give in to these little things. And what do you have underneath the rug pad? Oh, yeah, secret. This is a, it came from Norway, you know. It, I can't find one here. Uh, it's just nice because it has um, grips on it so you can agitate. It holds water nicely. That's where bubble wrap would also work. So pool, a pool surface works well. All right, so this is kind of fluffy, so I'm going to add soap and water and compression. And I'm really gentle at this point, just on the surface. And I'm rubbing inward, because if I rub outward, I might push the fibers beyond the resist. So I'm gently pushing inward. Now, if I want to add a design on the surface of my bag, now's the time. 
like a, a palette, a blank canvas almost, almost. And what I might do is just take a little bit of this because <laughs> it's there. <laughs> this came from this bag. You can see that this is the wool that's not quite felted as well as this wool. So what happened is that I think this just got cut off from up here. But now this is called pre-felt. Not fully felted, but the fibers have bonded, but not permanently. So that means I can cut them up into shapes and they hold it, retain their shape. And they make a really nice um, design accent. Kind of random. I'm just going to do it. Okay. Nothing better than watching wool combine and seeing what it does. How they they melt together it's kind of watercolor that magic of playing with different colors and different different layers if you can feel the water coming through your fingers when you do this you have too much water it's good to soak some of that up and now it's really about surface rubbing because I put a design on and I want it to stay in place. So I'm just going to gently rub that a little bit. I'm encouraging the fibers to stay where I tell them. I say that encouragement because sometimes they don't listen. That's where needle felting comes in. So if you really wanted a, a particular design, you could needle felt your wool in place. Um, but in general, like in this case, it's just a little bit of abstract design quality. Ah, sweet. The nice thing about pre-felt is that you have two colors. One color will sort of be a shadow that will come through. So you, a person could spend bit, quite a bit of time making pre-felts just to play with and doing collages. So what I do know, that the bag is going to open here. Well, maybe it's going to open here, and I'm going to have a flap, if that makes sense. Okay, so the design's here. I'll be cutting it right there. Okay. I'm going to see if I can be a super speedy felter. I'm still pretty gently rubbing. I'm not too aggressive. I'm give you pressure. Um, another tool I like to use is a tile. Um, it has some weight and the fibers don't, they tend to stick to your hands more than the, the tile. So it, it compresses fibers together, agitates, it has little ridges on it. They, they can be made out of wood, they can be made out of ceramics. I also use a lepsipan roller, a rolling pin at times. Okay, I'm gonna rub that side I think well enough that my design won't go away. It's not attached yet, you can see it's still gonna pull off. But what happens next is that we're gonna roll this whole thing up and that will agitate three-dimensionally all the fibers together. So, so far I've been agitating the surface and wanting these fibers to, to combine and bond. Next I'm going to roll it up after I rub this side and then we'll be doing the three-dimensional agitation. Always adding soap and hot water makes things go faster with felting. Okay. Ooh, look at that hairy. Haha. <laughs> that might mean more soap, more water. And it also might mean that's the wolf type. But the breed that it is, it might just stay hairy.
Alright, I'm going to jump forward and roll. So you can roll around a pool noodle, they'll sell you lots of things in the store, but you don't really need them. I'm going to use a towel, I'm going to get it wet, otherwise I'll pull all the water out of the wool. I'm just going to roll it up, and this is going to be my first roll of agitation. And I'm causing those individual wool fibers to bond together because their scales are open because they've been warmed so those scales kind of relax. Uh, the soap has been added so this, the fibers can migrate and move freely. And the agitation is causing the fibers to come closer and closer together and bond. And the more I agitate this, the stronger and smaller the bag becomes. So the bag actually might shrink about 30% once it's all said and done. You can see I'm rolling pretty gently right now. You don't want to squish anything because you'll squish fibers out of place. So I'm just encouraging still. So I'm going to roll in every direction. So. If I roll in only one direction, it's going to shrink in that direction. And it will become a very narrow bag. So I'm going to open it up. You can see it's curling up already. That means it's beginning to shrink and the fibers are kind of bonding together. So I'm going to flip it over. Ooh, there's my design. Cover it up again. I like to add more soap. other direction. And now already I can feel like I can be a little bit more aggressive. Um, the fibers are starting to bond. I can push a little bit harder. Um, some people ask how many times do you do this? Well, some people will count and say roll a hundred times every direction. I'm more of a roll for a while, turn it, roll for a while, turn it. But as a beginner, it's good to know numbers sometimes. So I'm going to flip it over again and I'm going to roll the length this time. I can tell that the fibers look kind of slippery. Those white fibers are not wanting to bond very well. Interesting. That's probably because they had some oil in them. Because they weren't fully washed, like they weren't scoured like a lot of the wool you buy in the store. It has been all the lanolins taken out. And I washed that wool. And I kind of like leaving lanolin in. Um, but it means it's slower to felt and it needs more soap. stretch out the wrinkles because it wants to it wants to shrink up and wrinkle but I'm not gonna let it So this process uh, that I'm showing you right now, maybe most of you, some of you know, um, it's called a three-dimensional resist, wet felting. So you have something in the middle between layers of wool that create a pocket. And I use that same technique for hats, slippers, mittens, 
all these things start flat. And then once the fiber is bonded well enough to cut it open and not fall apart, then you begin to sculpt it. And I think that's really the fun part. Well, it's one of the more enjoyable because you're getting close to the end of the project. You start to shape it and shrink it the way you want it to shrink. You can stretch it and pull it. So there's lots of flexibility with the wool still at this point of how it shrinks. Who had asked where you get wool size big enough for your vest? Ah, that, this vest, um, it's about laying wool fiber up in small little bits. Yeah, so it's, it's not about the size of the wool, if that was a question. Um, it's not a, it wasn't a bat, so I laid out the wool fibers over red silk is the base. And then, and cheesecloth, white cheesecloth, with very thin amount of wool. So in this whole vest is four ounces of wool, I think. So it's a very thin amount of wool. And that's a trick about doing a vest is that it's easy to get too thick and you become kind of Neanderthal in their, the weight of your wool. And if you were to wonder with a bat. Yeah, it wasn't a bat, no, but you could, as long as you pull it out thin enough. Okay, it's beginning to shrink because you can see how it's gotten to curl up. And it's what I would call passing the pinch test, where fibers don't fall apart. You become pull up and it's a tent. So I think it's a little premature to cut open, but I want to cut it open with you. It's a little premature because I can tell its fibers are still a little bit weak, but I can keep on felting, but I want to cut open. I'm thinking about my flap being right there. Now I wish I had a piece of red. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> that would be nice. I think I can still do it. Oh yeah. Watch that. Now if I had a needle, which I do, gives it a lid. Okay, I want it there, but the fibers are starting to felt on the surface, so it's less likely to grab new wool, but the needle will help. I'm gonna put it on a sponge, and that is gonna encourage that wool to stay put. Even though it's gotten less attention than the rest of the wool, and it's gonna help. And now I'm gonna just spot rub this because I really want it there. It's not straight. So it needs a little water and a little soap and extra attention. So, spot rubbing, felting. Where this thing comes in handy, the tile. You hear it working. Some people use bubble wrap for this also. If you don't have something like this, um, just your hands do work. Just keep your hands soapy. So let's check that out. I think it's gonna work. Mm hmm. Okay. So now what we have. I wish it went over the edge. Didn't. <laughs> How much are your earrings over there? 35. Thirty-five. Yeah. A little extra attention to that little piece of color I just added. I'm going to do one more roll and then we're going to cut it. a more aggressive roll. So I'm going to actually wrap it up in the towel. That will hold it together a little bit longer and allow me to press a little bit more. I don't know 
why I chose this project. Because it's really not a half an hour project. <laughs> but you can kind of see the, the, the beauty of using a resist and how many directions you can go when you can create fabric out of that wool and you have a three-dimensional piece. Um, and now it's not that hard. Okay, now I'm feeling that is fabric. It's becoming pretty stiff. Well, not stiff, but durable. So I feel good about cutting it open now. There I go. Okay, is there any reason why I want to cut it this way? Oh, that's kind of nice too. Can everybody vote? <laughs> I'm kidding. Any votes? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm going for it. So I don't want to cut through the, the resist. I just want to cut one side up to the edge. And then I have this little extra flap. What do I want to do with that? I think I'm going to, hmm. Hmm. Actually, gonna leave a tail. Yeah. Imagine this comes down here, and I have a hmm. The fun of felting. I'm just gonna cut this off right here, and we'll see what that becomes over time. I cut that wool just now, it's pretty weak. Those edges, you can see how they're not really fully bonded because they are still pre felt. I'm going to add a little extra attention to wherever I cut with a soapy hand and some warm water. I can always cut these off later if I don't like them. I thought it was material that was there. I don't kind of wanted to keep it. Okay. I'm going to cut that off. Make that a little bit nicer. pieces. They might stick on there. We'll see. I don't like to waste anything. How are we doing for time? 1249. Okay. I don't know if anybody's still watching, but... <laughs> still watching. And we won't get cut off from okay. it. My goal, yeah, this would be pretty close to being done. Pretty close. So I, now I'm really putting some force into it because I have this curtain between me and the wool. I couldn't be so aggressive if I was just rubbing the wool. Mm, okay. The plastic's still in there, but I can take it out. Now I think about it becoming a three dimensional piece because right now it's a flat piece. And it has what I call a crease. And I want to get rid of a crease. It's always my goal. Still really flexible, this wool. You can really stretch it at this point. If I wanted to be a little bit longer, I could stretch it. But my focus right now is to get rid of these edges. And that's, that's a tricky point of uh, knowing when to open up a resist. Because you want the fiber to be strong enough to handle 
being cut open and manipulated, but not so stiff that these creases are permanent. So right now I can see it's a little bit flexible and I can rub it and those creases will go away. So again, it's soap and rubbing. My hand is on the inside to kind of create a round area to rub over. And I like, well, I'd like some water. And I also can open it up this way. You can see how flexible the fiber is? That's not falling apart. I'm going to rub that. Decreasing. Decreasing the crease. Okay. And I'll do that to the other side. There's a crease in the bottom too. I'll work on that next. Get that corner. And you can kind of, there's a crease in there. You can kind of pull it out and stretch it. Kind of work the crease out. Here, I'm going to stretch that a little bit because it wants to be a bump. So soap and water, or soap and rubbing. There's a lot of pressure now. Okay, it's hardly shrinking so far. So the bag is actually, it's not far from being done. It goes pretty quick but it hasn't shrunk almost at all yet. Here's the resist, we can see. And I want to shrink about 30% and that's when I know it's done. So that means the last few minutes is gonna be about hot water and agitation. These are, we'll see what happens with these. I haven't given them much attention. We'll see if I like them or not. Ideally, I'd spend some time um, rolling them and they become nice little curls, coils. But I think I won't do that right now. I'm going to focus on finishing the bag and just let them be. So the bottom, there's not much of a crease there. That's good. A little bit of soap. I can also turn this whole thing inside out and that will sort of de get rid of the creases. Isn't that amazing how the fibers just, what, 20 minutes ago was this loose batting and now it's this flexible, malleable fabric and it's stretchable. And now I'm going to focus on the shrinking of it. So I'm going to add some hot water. I'm actually going to first squeeze out all the cold water. some hot water and then roll and now rolling let's see I like to use a just a kitchen cloth cotton kitchen cloth for this final step of kind of this, the shrinking period and that just allows me to have really good grip and roll it really tight. And I want to convince them to flip. Stay that way, hopefully. Well, I will be impressed if this gets done by one o'clock, but it'll be close. Because this is really the final stage. It's the, the agitation, the more aggressive more aggressive and adding hot water that causes it to shrink at the very end after the fibers have bonded and i'm not worried about it falling apart at this point but i am worried about which way it's shrinking so i have to again flip it and change the direction it rolls you can see how it curled up it's not far from being done i can stretch it that will actually strengthen the fibers and i'm shaping it as i go now I, sh I roll it this way, so it got shorter. So I want to roll it this way. I want to make sure it's not felting together. And maybe I decide I like this side reversed, 
rather than flipping it back inside out. We'll see. Because it could be either way at this point. Julie asks us not to quit the video until it's completed. <laughs> They're dedicated. There's a lot of folks watching. Good. <laughs> I'm happy to finish. That's this is the most satisfying part, actually. A lot of people, when I'm teaching a class, will you know it's it's it seems like a very quick process right now as I'm doing this, but as when you're learning, it seems to take forever. This part of bonding the fibers together, and a lot of people will give up before it's done. Um, it'll look done enough, but enough is not durable. Often. It's shrunk some, but it's not strong. So it always takes a lot of encouragement to get people to go to that final stage of really fully felting something. So I'm really pushing down now. I'm putting a lot of energy into it. I'm almost breaking into a sweat. I really want to know the time because I want to. 12.56. Oh my goodness. I think we could do it. <laughs> so I'm going to stretch it because I want to be, I'm concerned about the shape. Look at that weird corner. I don't want that to have a weird corner. You can see the hair coming through from that white curly fiber I added. I'm going to flip it back around. You can see how all the fibers are melting together. This is the fun part, I think, of what you can kind of begin to see how it's going to become. How those fibers blend. Okay, now we've got these little flippy doos, whatever they're for, I don't know yet. I'm going to do another hot bath and roll and try to shape it in the next three minutes. So, how much time I have? We won't get cut off. Don't worry too much about it. Look at this aggression. This is the agitation. So, I'll do one more. One more roll. I would like some soap in there, though. Ooh, it's nice and soapy. Great. So, I'm going to stretch it because I want to... I want to shrink in the way I tell it to, and I want to pull it where it looks like it's a little bit contorted, being aware of how it will shrink. And now I decide do I want to shrink this way or this way. And I do want to work on these things because they would look nice if they were coiled up. Ooh, it's hairy. I'm going to shrink it narrow. You think it's going to fold up and do all these weird things when you do this, but they will unfold. You will un undo those creases that, that you're rolling in. Now I'd say, am I trying to put my full body weight into this? So when you're working on a pair of slippers or a vest, it's a workout. And you, you can see my body is sort of pushing into it. I'm using my full full force. But if you're working on something large, it takes a lot of energy. Okay. Uh, okay. Look at that white fiber really crawling through everywhere. Fun. Okay. Now, one. I'm going to play with these a little bit and see what I can do. Before you're done, too, can you show the original resist again? Yes. Too, so yeah. Yep. Trunk. So I want to strengthen those a little bit. And I think what might be nice with these is that if you, when we dry it, we can dry them curled up and they'll hold that shape. Cool. I'm happy with this little thing. <laughs> to fold it maybe. Let's get it to roll.
Whereas they do want to bond if you're rubbing them together. They want to stick to each other. Nice. Okay. And then do we leave one? <laughs> okay. No. So, a little bit of rolling on that, and then we're gonna rinse it, and rinse it, give it a final agitation, and shape it. It's like human hair. Even human hair will felt with enough work. Wool is better. All right, cool. Now I'm gonna rinse and and shape it. Roll it up in a towel to dry it. Oh, we're done. So I'm gonna rinse in hot water. If you really want to get the the soap out, add a little drop of a squirt of vinegar. But I think suggested you the, the oh yes, you can do that. That would be nice. So now I'm agitating also, still giving those fibers the bond. So I want it to be really durable. So if a dog picks it up, they can't tear it apart. Fun. This is the excitement of a uh, of wool, what they I couldn't have predicted the way these would have blended together. That's one of the things I love about wool. Um, combining the painterliness of it and the durability of it, the possibility of so many forms. So right now I'm stretching and shaping. And then, hmm, fun. And if I just crease this, it'll It'll dry flat and have a nice memory of a fold. You could shove something in there when you dry it to keep it a three-dimensional form. But that's about it. So this could be braided. It feels, it feels pretty durable. I could work it a little bit longer. But it feels still pretty stretchy. So I wouldn't say it's fully felted, but it's strong. I probably would do one more roll with this in hot water, and that would be good. But for now and for today, I think we completed a bag, and I've never done that before. 30 minutes. <laughs> Don't try to do this at home and expect it to work, okay? <laughs> it helped out pressure of a video, but yeah. So small bag. Um, this fall I'll be teaching a slipper class and which is wet felting over resist and that's November. Um, beyond that I'm not sure there'll also be a holiday uh, making holiday ornaments or Tompkins later on in the year. So join me when you can and I look forward to being together. Again. Awesome. Thanks from everybody Elise. Great. Nice to be here. Thanks for being here.